Boris Johnson warns the UK is facing an emergency in the battle with the new Omicron variant. He's calling for a massive increase in booster jabs, more than a million a day in England, from now until the end of the month. There is a tidal wave of Omicron coming, and I'm afraid it is now clear that two doses of vaccine are simply not enough to give the level of protection we all need. There'll be additional support too for the devolved nations to help them accelerate their booster programs, also tonight. After a picture emerges from last Christmas of Boris Johnson taking part in a quiz at Downing Street, Labour says he may have broken COVID rules. We have a special report from Afghanistan, where the drugs trade is booming following the Taliban takeover. And in a thrilling and controversial end to the Formula One season, Max Verstappen snatches victory from Lewis Hamilton to become world champion. Good evening. There's to be a rapid acceleration of the vaccination pro booster programme after Boris Johnson warned of a tidal wave of infections due to the new Omicron variant of coronavirus. Addressing the nation from number 10, he said thousands of extra volunteers and military planners will be drafted in so that all eligible adults in England can be offered a booster jab by the end of this month. It's understood that could mean up to 18 million jabs in just 19 days, with the Prime Minister warning that some NHS appointments would have to be postponed to free up resources for the rollout. There'll also be additional support to speed up vaccinations in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. The announcement came as the UK's COVID alert level was raised from three to four. Our medical editor, Fergus Walsh, has the full story. Queuing round the block for their booster, you'll see a lot more of this in the coming days. From tomorrow, the over 30s in England and Scotland will be able to book their booster and the over 18s from later in the week. Good evening. Over the past year... Addressing the nation tonight, the Prime Minister said the country was facing an emergency in its battle against Omicron. There is a tidal wave of Omicron coming and I'm afraid it is now clear that two doses of vaccine are simply not enough to give the level of protection we all need. That a wave of Omicron through a population that was not boosted would risk a level of hospitalisation that could overwhelm our NHS and lead, sadly, to very many deaths. So, we must act now. The original target was to offer a booster to all over 18s by the end of January. That's now been brought forward to the end of the month. It'll require a million jabs in arms a day, double what's being achieved now. This huge push on boosters comes at a price. Record waiting lists are set to get even longer. It will mean some other appointments will need to be postponed until the new year. But if we don't do this now, the wave of Omicron could be so big that cancellations and disruptions, like the loss of, of cancer appointments, would be even greater next year. Up to 200,000 Omicron cases daily are thought possible by the end of December, four times the current level. But although a few Omicron-infected patients are now in hospital, it's unclear how severe the variant is. We have to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. Uh, and I think our job is to highlight that this is a big wave. It's coming straight at us. If we see even half the severity that we saw with Delta, then we're facing a very large number of hospitalizations and potential deaths. The UK's COVID alert level has been raised to four out of five, meaning pressure on the NHS is widespread, but it's not yet at risk of being overwhelmed. Labour has backed the plan to speed up vaccination. They warned the government they hadn't been doing enough to get the booster rollout underway. And so tonight's announcement is one that we can very much get behind. This has got to be a big national effort. All of us have got a part to play. The big question is, can that booster target be met with Christmas just round the corner? 
And will there be time to reach those most in need? The one area of anxiety is that in this rush to get the booster out, we mustn't forget our more vulnerable people who may be struggling to get to um, vaccination clinics, may, may not find it easy to book online. And, and these are the people who are most vulnerable to severe disease. So the battle lines against Omicron are drawn. The race between the vaccine and the virus will be at a faster pace than anything we've seen so far. Fergus Walsh, BBC News. Well, tonight's announcement on boosters by the Prime Minister was only in relation to England. But Boris Johnson said the UK government will provide additional support to accelerate vaccinations in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. In a moment, we'll be hearing from Hal Griffith in Cardiff and Chris Page, who's in Belfast. But first, let's go to Katrina Renton, who's in Glasgow for us tonight. Katrina. Well, from tomorrow, the over 30s here in Scotland will also be able to start booking appointments for their boosters. And later in the week, the over 18s will be able to do so too. Now, in a statement this evening, the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, said that urgent efforts are being made to step up the pace of offering booster vaccinations with the aim that every eligible adult in Scotland will be offered a booster by the end of the year, if possible. Now, you'll remember on Friday, the First Minister predicted a potential tsunami of cases over the weekend. The Scottish Government has been discussing whether further restrictions might be needed here. And on Tuesday, the First Minister is set to address the Scottish Parliament to update on the booster rollout and whether any new measures might be needed. In Wales at the moment, the target remains to offer every adult a booster jab by the end of January, something that was already seems hugely ambitious. We've heard of staff having their leave cancelled, Christmas changes planned. The NHS in Wales is already under huge winter pressures. Now, a million booster jabs have been delivered here. That includes about 85% of people in their 70s, but only 20% of people in their 40s. And at the moment, that offer hasn't been given to younger people. There's no online booking system here in Wales either. Tonight, the Welsh Government have told us they'll do everything they can to accelerate the programme in Wales, but they say the priority will remain older people and those most vulnerable. There'll also be a review of Covid measures here later this week. The Health Minister saying today she expects more uh, restrictions to be introduced. Well, Northern Ireland currently has the highest COVID infection rate of the UK's four nations, but health officials believe the Omicron variant isn't at present circulating here as much as elsewhere. So far, there are 10 confirmed cases of the variant. Proportionally, fewer people here have been vaccinated compared with England, Scotland and Wales. Though in the last few weeks, there has been a significant increase, we're told, of people coming forward to get their first jab. Just over 40% of adults have had their booster. And as of today, if you're 30 years old or older, well, you can walk into a vaccination centre to get your booster. The First Minister, Paul Given of the Democratic Unionist Party, has been telling us this evening how the devolved government is planning to step up the booster programme further. We've got hundreds of new vaccinators haven't been recruited. Uh, we're looking at extending the capacity within existing hubs, but also with our community pharmacies. We have an important arrangement there, and that's allowing people in their own local community to go to their local chemist and they're getting their jabs. So the message from Minister Scheer is very much be alert, be cautious, but don't panic. And ministers have been pretty clear that they don't expect any more restrictions to be brought in this side of Christmas. Chris, many thanks for that. Chris Page there in Belfast. And thanks also to Hal Griffith in Cardiff and Katrina Renton in Glasgow. Well, the government's latest coronavirus figures for the UK show there were 48,854 new infections recorded in the latest 24-hour period, which means on average there were 51,497 new cases reported every day in the past week. 52 deaths were recorded. This of people who died within 28 days of a positive test, which means the average number of people who died every day was 119. On vaccinations, just over 23 million people so far have received a third dose or booster jab. Let's get more on all of this now from our medical editor, Fergus Walsh, who's here. Um, Fergus, the numbers are staggering. 18 million jabs in 19 days. Is it even possible? 
It's a massive undertaking, absolutely unprecedented. It will need a million doses a day right to the end of the year, and that's never been done. One day in March last year, 850,000 doses was achieved, but only half a million a day are being managed now. The NHS is going to have to throw everything at this. Now, that will mean more vaccination sites, longer opening hours, more military involvement, and GPs doing very little else. So it will come at a cost to non-COVID care. And the alarm, obviously, because of Omicron and the way that it's speeding through in terms of infections. Yeah, doubling every two to three days. There's an expectation now that we'll have 100,000, maybe 200,000 cases, infections, by the end of the month. Um, two doses of vaccine may not stop you getting infected, but should give significant protection against severe disease. But we don't know how severe a disease Omicron causes. Many think it'll be less severe than Delta, but if we wait to find out, it'll be too late. Interesting, Clive, that the focus from the Prime Minister tonight was all about boosters, no talk about new restrictions in the run-up to Christmas. Indeed. OK, Fergus, many thanks. Fergus Walsher, our medical editor. Now, the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, says Boris Johnson appears to have broken the law when he took part in a Christmas quiz at Downing Street last year. At the time, coronavirus restrictions meant social mixing between households was banned. The Sunday Mirror has published a photograph of the quiz showing the Prime Minister seated next to two people. Downing Street says it was a virtual event. Our political correspondent Chris Mason has more details. It's the Christmas quiz a year ago that Downing Street says was virtual, but where two of the Prime Minister's colleagues are sitting next to him, one with tinsel wrapped around his neck, and, a source tells the BBC, others were there in person, sitting in groups of six. This at a time when social mixing was banned in London. So, question one. Given that, was he breaking the law? Well, it looks as though he was, um, and um, he must have known those other groups were in other rooms in his own building. And, you know, this is very important because yeah. he's damaged his authority, he's now um, so weak, his party is so divided, he can't deliver the leadership that this country needs. He's the worst possible leader at the worst possible time. No person may participate. So, what's the government's explanation for this? What do we see? We see a Prime Minister in his office with two of his staff next to him. There's no drinks. My, my email box full of people thinking that these are sort of, you know, parties with guests and you know, all sorts of things happening. Actually, they can now make their mind up when they see this picture of a Prime Minister on a virtual screen, on a Zoom call, thanking his team um, who are in the building because they have to, to respond to a national emergency. Okay. Then they can make their mind up. He did say, though, that it was right that the country's most senior civil servant is looking into three other social gatherings in the weeks before Christmas last year. For day after day, the Prime Minister and his team tried to brush off to deny reports of a party or get-togethers around government, including in there, when social mixing was banned a year ago. And yet this is the latest in a torrent of stories which rather suggests otherwise about what was actually going on. And it's left plenty of people incredibly angry. I know that people I represent here in Murray and across the Highlands and Islands followed that guidance to the letter of the law because they were told to do it in the national interest. And if the people telling them to do that couldn't follow that guidance, then we are right to be angry at them. People's irritation with what happened in government a year ago collides with the reality of now, another winter where those who lead us are shaping the rules and the collective response to a resurgence of the virus. Chris Mason, BBC News at Westminster. Well, let's talk to our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, who's in Downing Street for us tonight. Laura, an address to the nation, unusual at any time, let alone on a Sunday night, a sign of the deep concern in that building behind you. I think that's right, Clive. They are very rare events, ones we've got all too used to actually seeing in the last few years. But for any prime minister to use the authority of the building to sit alone in front of the camera trying to talk directly to the public, that is a very unusual moment. And I think it is a mark of the concern in government about just how quickly this new variant of COVID has been spreading. And also a mark of the message that they want to get across to the public that people must take this seriously, that the 
risk is genuinely back and to shake them out of any sense of perhaps complacency because of course most of the population has already had two doses of the vaccine. We are not in the same kind of situation that we were initially. Of course though that is very difficult for the Prime Minister to get across because of everything that's been going on in the last few weeks in terms of politics. The shambles, the denials, the non-denials, the chaotic scenes that we've seen and perhaps Boris Johnson felt that he needed the trappings of the polished desk in Downing Street, that moment where he wanted to be talking directly to the public. Perhaps he felt he needed that to try to establish some of his authority. But eyebrows have, of course, been raised about the manner in which it was made, the fact that he didn't wait to give a statement to Parliament tomorrow or even give a press conference. In those two circumstances, of course, he would have actually had to face questions, perhaps questions about why the booster programme has taken so long to get going, according to his critics. Why still have so many teenagers not had the vaccine? Things that some people suggest could have made a real difference to the situation that we are now finding ourselves in. And many of his MPs, of course, are are frankly fed up to the back teeth of all of this. But just as some of them might believe that Boris Johnson is overreacting, if we end up in a terrible situation because of Omicron, some of his critics on the other side might believe that actually in the last few weeks he's been underreacting. But no doubt this is a tricky moment for the government indeed. No question about it. So much at stake for Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, but much more importantly, so much at stake for the public for all of us. Laura, thank you. Laura Kuzberg there live in Downing Street. In America, at least 94 people have died and dozens are missing after the devastating wave of tornadoes that hit a large part of the southeast on Friday. A desperate search for survivors is underway across six states with emergency crews combing through the debris. Our correspondent Nomia Iqbal has the very latest from Mayfield in Kentucky. There were more than 30 tornadoes, but one hurtled down a single track of more than 200 miles. It is thought to be the longest path ever taken by a tornado in US history. It flattened many homes whilst leaving others untouched. In an instant, this small town of Mayfield has been almost entirely wiped out. Flattened homes are now buried in their own debris Toys and shoes are scattered amongst the twisted metal and shredded trees by a swarm of tornadoes that no one had prepared for. for? Dineen is looking for her cousin who lives downtown. Everybody's cell phone is down and so, and I get up early and I'm just so nervous I couldn't sleep. And just to really see, because I couldn't get through here yesterday. And I drive a school bus and all, everything over there is destroyed. It's just, it's just heartbreaking. This is one of the main churches that residents here in Mayfield attended. It's about 100 years old. And people here tell me it only took around 10 seconds for the tornado to blow through and destroy so much of it. Some people actually took cover in here on the night that the storms came. Nearby churches have opened up their doors to give shelter to those who survived. Jerry and his father managed to escape. His mother, who is in a nursing home, is unaware of what's happened. My mother still doesn't know the house is gone. And we're not going to tell her. Why not? It just broke her heart to let her know that the dream house that she designed is gone. An operation is still underway at a candle factory in Mayfield. More than 100 workers were on the night shift when the tornado tore through. 40 people managed to make it out. In the state of Illinois, an Amazon factory is looking for its missing employees. The Amazon founder, Jeff Bezos, pledged to offer support. The governor here in Kentucky says this is the deadliest tornado event the state has ever had. President Biden has signed a federal emergency disaster declaration to help this state and others ravaged by the storms. Nomi Rickbell, BBC News, Kentucky. The Foreign Secretary Liz Truss has warned Russia that it would face massive consequences if it were to invade Ukraine and said all options were being considered. She was speaking at a meeting of G7 foreign ministers in Liverpool as thousands of Russian troops mass on the Ukrainian border. The ministers condemned the build-up, saying there would be a severe cost following any military aggression from Moscow. 
Police investigating the disappearance of a children's hospital worker in South London have found a body in a park. Scotland Yard say Petra Senchova's family are being kept informed, although the body hasn't yet been identified. The 32-year-old was last seen on the 28th of November. She was reported missing five days later. Amidst an economic collapse in Afghanistan, the country's drug trade seems to be booming. It's long been linked with the production of heroin and is also now a major producer of crystal meth. The Taliban says for the moment it cannot ban drug production because there are no alternative sources of income for poor families. Our correspondent Sekunda Kamani and cameraman Malik Mudassa report now from Afghanistan. They're one of Afghanistan's most lucrative exports. But these drugs are destroying lives here and abroad. There's heroin and increasingly now crystal meth. This, an exclusive look at where the meth is coming from. These drugs in southern Afghanistan will be smuggled to countries as far away as Australia. The amount in this room alone would sell there for around two million pounds. This is how it's made. Makeshift open-air labs in the desert, under the noses of the Taliban. These trucks are full of a key ingredient. Traffickers here have discovered a common wild plant can be used to produce meth cheaply. Last week, the Taliban banned farmers from picking it, but they're not shutting down the meth labs. This man, with links to the trade, says crystal meth is booming. When the Taliban announced their ban on this plant, he tells me, the wholesale price of meth doubled and there are still warehouses full of it. It's another dangerous drug, opium, from poppies like these, most commonly associated with Afghanistan. Around 80% of the world's heroin supply originates here. Before the Taliban takeover, opium traders paid off corrupt officials and sold the black paste secretly. Now they've been allowed to open up stalls in markets. We're driving through a bazaar where opium is being sold openly. Much of it is then going to be processed into heroin. The Taliban are not stopping drug production. In fact, they've been taxing it for years. But they don't want journalists seeing it being traded. That's why we're filming from inside the car. You call yourselves an Islamic government, but you're allowing drug production. Isn't that hypocritical? Under the Islamic Emirate, before 2001, the growing and selling of opium dropped to zero. Right now, we are trying to find alternatives. We can't take this away from people without offering them something else. Eradicating this is good for us in the international community, so the world should help too. For years, poor farmers have relied on opium to provide for their families. Now, as Afghanistan's economy collapses without international support and water levels continue to drop, many see it as the safest crop to grow. Opium destroys a lot of people's lives. If opium is banned, what will happen to you guys and your families? The Taliban regularly haul these addicts off to rehab centers, but many end up straight back here. For now, more drugs look set to hit the streets, both in Afghanistan and across the world. Sukhanda Kamani, BBC News, Afghanistan. Max Verstappen has been confirmed as the new Formula One world champion after a thrilling and controversial end to the final race of the season in Abu Dhabi. The 24-year-old Dutchman beat Britain's Lewis Hamilton on the last lap to win his first title, denying Hamilton a record eighth championship.
The final result has been challenged by Hamilton's Mercedes team, but the result was upheld. Our sports correspondent Natalie Perks reports now from Abu Dhabi. It was billed as the decider in the desert. And in the afternoon heat of Abu Dhabi, fans were split firmly into two camps. Hamilton supporters were confident he was about to leave an indelible mark on the sport. There's no, no one else like Lewis. If he beats Max today and gets the eighth title, he will definitely be the greatest of all time. But Hamilton was up against an orange wall. What would it mean to you to have a Dutch world champion? A, a tear. <laughs> Red Bull had pole, but Mercedes had the faster car. And Hamilton gets a decent start. And he's a dream start, more like, but Verstappen was hot on his tail, with a late lunge forcing Hamilton wide. Almost coming together. Hamilton gained time. The stewards said this was fair. By lap 13, Verstappen's soft tyres were struggling, so he pitted, leaving his Red Bull teammate to try and hold Hamilton up. And this is really frustrating, Lewis Hamilton. But then, a virtual safety car allowed Verstappen to swoop into the pits, and on fresh tyres, he chased the gap. Red Bull knew it would be tough. We're going to need a miracle. Or a huge controversy. Another crash meant a safety car and yet more fresh tyres for the Dutchman. But when the governing body ruled that some lapped cars would be allowed to overtake the safety car, it gave Verstappen one last lap, one last shot. By Verstappen, who takes the lead of the race. A controversial ending was always on the cards. Both drivers were in tears for different reasons. Max Verstappen is champion. Well, that was truly unbelievable. Lewis Hamilton has every reason to feel frustrated tonight, but Red Bull and Verstappen absolutely nailed it. And he is the new world champion. It's unbelievable. I mean, throughout the whole race, I kept fighting, and then, of course, that opportunity in the last lap, it's insane. A big congratulations to Max and to his team. This last part of the season, we gave it absolutely everything, and uh, we never gave up, and that's the most important thing. Fans back home at Silverstone were getting ready to celebrate but were left disappointed. I'm shocked. Um, I, I believe that that win of Lewis was stolen from him and the championship shouldn't have been decided that way. I think it's meant to be Lewis's. He's a cleaner driver. You can see he's a better driver. But no sooner had the champagne corks popped that two protests were lodged from Mercedes. Unlike VAR in football, this took hours till finally Red Bull emerged victorious. He got a little bit lucky with the safety car tonight, but he had to make it pay. And, you know, the, the strategy, um, we didn't want it to end in the stewards room. We didn't take it into the stewards room, but, uh, you know, they've come to the right decision. Mercedes are appealing again, but for Stappen is the champion. Max, how do you feel? Not too bad. I <laughs> can't complain. Typical Dutch understatement on the biggest night of his life. Natalie Perks, BBC News, Abu Dhabi. That's it. Now on BBC One, time for the news where you are. Have a very good night.